everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. In today's video, I'll be addressing three of the major criticisms of the upcoming Wheel of Time television show. We'll be taking a look at whether these are valid criticisms or whether they're unfounded. Before getting into the video, I first want to remind everybody about the contest that we're running currently on the channel to get on to the next Wheel of Time Jeopardy and face off against our defending champion, Angry Trevor. How do you enter? Well, it's easy, and you'll be supporting a cause that I'm super passionate about, and I hope you can be too. I've committed to raising $5,000 for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to granting the wishes of critically ill children. Not only does Make-A-Wish grant wishes to really ill children, but it gives them an opportunity to do something that they might not ever be able to do on their own, and many of those children that have wishes granted go on to beat their disease or illness. Many of them will then attribute them beating it to having the wish granted. Wish kids are statistically more likely to live through their illness than non-wish kids. Additionally, the families of these critically ill children get a moment of joy during a very difficult time, and it can actually save a family and save the parent's marriage. I personally know wish kids, and I've been supporting this organization for years. So, for the contest, I'm asking you to help me raise money for Make-A-Wish. For every $5 you donate through my link, you'll be entered into the contest to make it onto Wheel of Time Jeopardy. I'll be doing the drawing at the end of this week, so you have one week from the release of this video. If every single one of my subscribers donated $1, we would double my goal, so this should be an easy one for us to hit. Even if you don't want to be a part of the contest, please consider supporting Make-A-Wish. So guys, thank you so much for your help there, and thank you to everybody who's already donated. Let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with spoilers all the way through Towers of Midnight. Please watch at your own risk. So the video today is primarily focused on three major criticisms I've seen in the Wheel of Time community when it comes to the upcoming show. My purpose here is to take a look at these criticisms and determine if they're based on fact or whether or not it's just the internet being the internet. So without further ado, Let's take a look at the first criticism. The Wheel of Time doesn't have much, if any, nudity and sex, but the showrunners are going to give it the Game of Thrones treatment. So I think the basic fear here among many in the fandom is that they believe the Wheel of Time is a fairly wholesome epic fantasy, in the style of Lord of the Rings or even Shannara Chronicles, and that it's nothing like Game of Thrones. So there's a fear that they're going to ramp up the sex and they're going to ramp up the nudity just to make it like Game of Thrones, and that's not what's in the books. And I think it's certainly understandable to think that way, as Robert Jordan was not incredibly explicit when describing sex. I think before taking this analysis any further, I want to go over the various instances of nudity, sexual innuendo, and sexual situations that are in the books. That'll give us a baseline to actually discuss this further. So let's start with the nudity. <laughs> Here are some examples that I could come up with, but I'm sure there are a few more that I didn't think of. The baths and Berlon with the boys. Rand is forced to watch his mother stripped naked in front of him and beaten by a murderall at the end of the Eye of the World. The Shinarans have co-ed baths, although that's talked about and not actually seen. Rand has his clothes taken and replaced in Shinar and servants are basically trying to see him naked. Nynaeve's testing for accepted in the White Tower and in the actual testing itself, they're both done in the nude. Sean Chan's slaves wear basically see-through clothing. Perrin walks in on Moraine completely nude in The Dragon Reborn. Egwene's tested for accepted is done in the nude. Matt is completely naked after being healed, laying there, and people come in and see him. The Sea Folk are topless while at sea. Avienda and Moraine both run to Roideon naked the first time. Matt is completely nude when fighting a Dark Hound in Roideon. The Aiel Sweat Tents are basically always nude, and these happen a lot. Aiel Gaishane are nude until they can be found white garments. The Aiel in general are very, very casual about nudity. Fayil, Morgase, Aliandra, and the rest of Fayil's posse are taken Gaishan and marched nude in the snow. Grendel keeps her slaves nude or scantily clad all around her. Elaine and Avienda's first sister ceremony is done in the nude. Rand is seen nude a couple of times in his room, even when people walk in, demonstrating a change from him being this conservative country boy at the beginning. Samarog tortures an Aes Sedai and her warder, and their clothes are removed. The raising of the Amarlin seat has all the Aes Sedai present topless. Rand and Avienda are nude together in their igloo. Tylan and Matt are both nude together a few times. Like I said, I'm sure there's a bunch more that I missed, but those are a few that I could think of. So let's shift gears now and let's talk about the times where there is sex, sexual innuendo, or sexual situations in the books. There are very few on-screen sexual moments. Rand and Avienda's igloo scene is one where we see them nude, but we see the buildup and not the actual act. 
<laughs> Rand and Min sleep together often, and we know that they're doing it, but we don't explicitly see it. Rand also sleeps with Elaine, and the reaction to it is felt by the other women that are bonded to him at the same time. Matt is seen in the nude while having sex with a Maiden of the Spear before the Dark Hounds attack. Matt is later forced to strip and have sex with Tylan at knife point, a scene that is essentially rape. They go on to have a regular sexual relationship. Misana is raped by Shidar Haran. It's implied that the same was done to Magidian and Sindane. It's implied that Morghese was raped by Eamon Evalda. Loghain has a sexual relationship with a number of his bonded female Aes Sedai, specifically Gabrielle. There are numerous references to pillow friends, and it's implied that Elida is having a sexual relationship with Madani. Balthamel and Aganor imply that they're going to enjoy pleasures of the flesh and eye of the world. Balthamel, reborn as Halima, makes sexual advances on many different men. Grendel's servants are very sexualized. But what's clear here is that Robert Jordan did not avoid sexual situations or implied sexual behavior, and there are elements of what would be considered very offensive content, like rape. He did, however, avoid writing very specific details of these events. We don't get the details of how it goes down, and he doesn't ever write about the specifics. But this is the very point that leads the showrunners to having a very clear decision point on how they want to approach this adaptation. And this decision will divide the fan base whatever direction they decide to go. The books are literally littered with nudity and some strong sexual themes, but the explicit sexual acts themselves are left to the imagination of the reader. There are a few ways they can go with it. Number one, they can remove the nudity completely and leave sexual things implied and not explicit. Number two, they can keep most of the nudity, as much of it is non-sexual, keep the sex as non-graphic but not shy away from the topics or sexual themes. And then number three, they can ramp up the sex to match the amount of nudity, and they have a very gritty and non-traditional show with darker themes then. Many fans will say that they want the book adapted as it was written. And this presents some difficult choices, as the adult nature of the books can be inconsistent at times. I think the route they're going to go is they're either going to be choice two or three there. I don't see them removing the nudity entirely and keeping the show PG. For one, the show is on Amazon. And if you've seen shows like The Boys and some of the more recent things they've made, they're trying to attract a certain type of audience, and young kids are not that audience. Two, if they remove the nudity, much of it is symbolic and has a purpose within the books. Whether it's ceremonial, cultural, or the, for the purpose of showing fish out of water kids dealing with other people that are way more liberal than they are, it's all written with purpose and it isn't gratuitous. Much of the nudity isn't even sexual in nature. Lastly, removing the nudity removes one of the adult themed things in the books and just leaves extreme violence. The show could feel fairly inconsistent in terms of its desired audience, and I do find it odd that people are fine with showing extreme violence and having that be okay for kids to see, but then there's boobs on the screen and then it's obscene. Just an interesting cultural dynamic to me. Nevertheless, I, I, the other reason I think they're going to go choice two or three there is they did put in the casting descriptions for some of the female characters that some nudity would be required. So there we have it. So to address the original criticism that they're going to give this the Game of Thrones treatment, I do think it's plausible that they might show sex that was written about in the books, but not really shown in the books. There's a ton of nudity within the books, but more actually than is in the Song of Ice and Fire books. If they faithfully adapted the books as they were written, the show would have a ton of nudity. So I think it's a valid concern for those among the fan base that are averse to seeing nudity in movies and TV shows. So I'm not going to say you're wrong for being worried about it, if that is indeed something that concerns you. I would say that despite that, the criticism is more about you not wanting to see nudity than you're worried they're going to change the story. The Wheel of Time TV show will be another Shannara Chronicles. So for those of you who have not read the Shannara Chronicles series by Terry Brooks, it's a series of high fantasy books that's very, very popular and was adapted into a television show a few years back, first on MTV, and then later Spike TV before ultimately being canceled after two seasons. The show debuted to a huge audience, the largest MTV had ever seen, pulling in 7.5 million viewers and getting a good critical reception, ironically. However, many fans of the series were disgusted with the adaptation. It had poor acting, mediocre visual effects, high school type drama, and model type actors that didn't really give off much substance. The show actually got a good critical reception, but struggled with ratings after its first season. Some of that had to do with MTV changing their lineup and essentially dropping all scripted shows from its service, which led to the show moving to Spike TV, a mostly male-oriented channel with a very niche viewership. So what was wrong with the show? Let's take a look at some of these factors and then take a look at what we know about The Wheel of Time so far 
and make a determination if this is a valid concern for the fan base. So one of the major issues, in my opinion, with the Shannara adaptation was not the adaptation itself, because despite the showrunners taking some liberties with the story, it really wasn't that far off from the books. The main issue, in my opinion, is the source material itself. The Shannara series is very typical and very stereotypical high fantasy. The characters are mostly tied to their roles or their tropes, and there isn't much character depth within the books as there is within The Wheel of Time or Song of Ice and Fire. Both of these books are known for their deep character development, which is one of the main reasons Game of Thrones was successful when typical fantasy television shows have not been. Shannara just wasn't a deep world, doesn't have that strong of characters, especially the side characters as Wheel of Time and Song of Ice and Fire. Another major issue was the show was designed for an MTV audience. Models were hired rather than really strong actors, and I know that's not necessarily true, that's a harsh criticism, but it kind of speaks for itself if you watch it. Drama was high school-like in nature, and some of the dialogue was painful. The people behind the show were some of the same ones that introduced Smallville into the CW, which isn't a bad show by any means, but there is a significant difference between making a show for the CW or MTV and then HBO and Amazon. It just simply had a much lower budget and it was obvious. The special effects were pretty awful. The set design was very minimal outside of a few locations. The show was shot in New Zealand, which is beautiful, but the details necessary to make a fantasy world come to life just weren't there. So is the Wheel of Time show headed down the same path? Will it have weak characters, a small budget, and designed for an MTV audience and ultimately destined to be cancelled early in its life? Well, it's hard to say definitively until we've seen the show on the air. But I can say I don't think the signs are pointing that way. For one, the budget behind the show will be significantly higher than what Shannara got. Amazon is throwing money at these fantasy adaptations, and based on the hires that we've seen on the production team, they are sparing no expense. Special effects, makeup, costume, and set design all have top tier people heading those departments. Check out some of my other TV show videos to get an in-depth look at their credentials, but guys, these are some of the best folks in the world. I don't believe we're gonna see cheesy special effects. I'll talk about it more here in a moment, but in terms of casting, it looks like they've gone after actors and actresses with strong acting skills, specifically in dramatic roles. Certainly they picked out attractive people to play these parts, but all of them have solid acting credentials to their name in dramatic roles that require more than just looking good for the camera. So is this a valid criticism? Is Wheel of Time TV show going to be the next Shannara Chronicles? Well, we won't know if the show's going to be a dud until we see it, but I think at this point it's just pessimism to say that you think the show will fail unless you just haven't looked at what's going on in the background. I really don't think this one is valid. They are changing the books and the adaptation to pander to minorities. So the third criticism I've been reading about the show, and probably the most controversial for some reason, uh, so controversial in fact that it's gotten Brandon Sanderson, the Jordan team itself, and various members of the media community around the Wheel of Time to address it at length, is the casting of darker skinned actors and actresses in the role of the main characters that aren't Rand. Frankly, I was very surprised at how angry some people are over this. So let's take a minute to dissect the arguments against the casting, see if they have any merit, and make a conclusion as to whether the criticism is valid. So let's start by laying out some of the reasons why people were upset over this. I think the most common reason is that there was a strong belief that the books portray the Emmons Fielders as mainly Caucasian, except with Rand just being taller with redder hair and paler than the other ones. Many were upset at what they perceived as Rafe and the Wheel of Time TV show team changing the ethnicities of these characters simply for some sort of pandering move trying to reach out to minorities rather than trying to stay authentic to the way the story was written. So is this true? Were the characters written as white? Well, this actually isn't a very easy question to answer. Let's take a look at the books themselves. With the exception of Rand, we are actually not given direct skin color descriptions of the characters very often within the books. There are a few examples, however, specifically addressing the Emmons Fielders. Senbui is described as having skin darker than a gnarled old root, implying a very much darker skin tone. Nynaeve is described as having dark skin when compared to other people. Elida comments in Camelin when examining Rand that the people from the Two Rivers have much darker skin than he does. This seems to be an implication that the people from the Two Rivers have a naturally darker skin color than the rest of Andor, but that the world is kind of a varied place. Now these are examples that the Two Rivers is not a homogeneous Caucasian society, regardless of how our headcanon might have played out while reading it. I can admit that I envisioned many of the characters as white, 
But that's because of my natural bias. I'm white. I envision many of them as white, even though they weren't explicitly described otherwise. I think that's the boat that many readers were in, and that's why they were initially upset over the casting. It just didn't fit your headcanon. But it, it isn't explicitly stated in the books that they were really pale white or whatever, and that Rafe and the team are on purpose going against what was in the books. That's just not there. But didn't Robert Jordan give examples of who he wanted the actors and actresses to look like in his interviews, you say? And the actors that he picked for the Emmons Fielders, they were all white. Doesn't that mean that he intended them to be all white? Also, the fan art, the graphic novels, and all of the other media have always portrayed them as white. So does that mean that they should be? Well, I addressed this briefly in my previous casting video, but let me go a bit further here with it because... Now I have backup from Team Jordan itself. Maria Livingston Simmons, Robert Jordan's personal assistant, and the person that Brandon Sanderson and Harriet both refer to as an expert on the Wheel of Time, as she is the keeper of Robert Jordan's notes, she released a statement in response to the casting. You can read that in the description below, but in a nutshell, she states that the list that RJ made was not about skin color, but more facial features. She said that the books don't reflect a homogeneous Caucasian culture for the two rivers, and that wasn't what Robert Jordan intended. She then went on to say that Harriet loves the casting choices and that Robert Jordan would be appalled at some of the racism around the reactions to the casting choices. These statements are pretty much saying that there was nothing wrong with the casting from his perspective, and again, outside of breaking people's headcanon. Brandon Sanderson also released a statement on the casting on Reddit. I'll link that in the description below as well. His statement is basically that it didn't fit his headcanon either, but it isn't against the books, and that this will be Rafe's interpretation of the Wheel of Time, which is what he was hired to do. No one can do Robert Jordan's vision, other than Robert Jordan. Even Brandon Sanderson himself was a bit different than Robert Jordan. Sanderson then goes on to say that he has read all of the scripts, knows what Rafe and the team are doing and planning with the series, and he endorses it completely and states unequivocally that Rafe is not pandering to any crowd with these casting choices, but they're part of a greater vision for the series. So we as fans are left with a choice here. We can either assume ourselves to know what Rafe's intentions are and that we believe he's trying to pander to minorities and change the story, or we can trust someone with intimate knowledge of what's going on with the show, someone who has intimate knowledge of the books themselves and Robert Jordan's notes, when he says that there is no pandering happening and this is part of a greater vision and that it fits with the story. I'm gonna go with option B until I see something otherwise. Rafe himself stated his views on the Wheel of Time world and ethnicity on Twitter some time ago. Here's a quote. Race is less defined in the Wheel of Time than our world. It's a mix of white, brown, black, and everything in between. The Wheel of Time world is a place where the entire world was once interconnected. That world was torn apart and people scattered, but society was rebuilt a few times in the 3,000 years after the breaking of the world, and Manetherin itself was a cosmopolitan empire. There are going to be people of varied skin colors all over the place. One other thing I wanted to address here is that none of these actors or actresses is extremely dark-skinned. They are all lighter-skinned people. This is exactly what you would have coming from a cosmopolitan world that had been cut off and then intermingled. For the most part, these people look similar, with the glaring exception of Rand, which is intended. Yes, Barney Harris is white, but again, having a society cut off does not mean that no one ever comes and goes and they all look exactly the same. There are merchants and traders, and none of this is out of the possibility of having a couple lighter skinned and a couple darker skinned people. So back to the original question, is this criticism valid? And I think on the surface, anyone is entitled to their opinion and entitled to their headcanon as that can be a really strong thing. I don't think that anyone was wrong to have questioned the picks at first because it isn't what they had in their head or what they thought about. I do think it's a bit disingenuous to say that the show is ruined because the actors or actresses are a different skin tone than you thought. I think you have to ask yourself the question, where do those strong emotions come from if that is your reaction to it, that I'm never going to watch it because they did this. Even after looking at the facts of it, if you're still furious over the casting choices, Again, ask yourself why. My personal opinion is I will judge the actors and actresses on their merit, not their skin color. From what I've seen, and I've watched almost all of their work now to be able to make this statement, I'm very impressed. There are essentially two points on this in my opinion. Number one, it really doesn't matter. Their skin color has no bearing on the story other than whether Rand looks different from the others. Outside of that, it's totally irrelevant, honestly. It doesn't affect the story in any way. Number two, even if it did matter, let's say that it did matter. The books leave it open-ended as I stated earlier. 
So this to me is really not an issue at all. My conclusion based on looking at it from an objective standpoint is that it's okay to have feelings that you didn't like it, but don't say this is because that's how Robert Jordan would have wanted it. It's a personal opinion on your end and you're entitled to that. I would hope that you would watch and enjoy the show regardless of the actors or actresses, as long as they do a good job. I'm encouraged by what I've seen and I will make a final judgment when I've seen the show. So those are my responses to the three main criticisms I've seen for the show. I'm curious what you all think. Please let me know in the comments below, but let's keep these comments civil. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. We are likely getting more casting news tomorrow, so I should have a video coming out about that as well, As and I also have a couple more ready. Uh, I'm about to get back on schedule to releasing content regularly. Uh, check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel. That link is in the description below. Hey guys, thank you all for watching, and until next time, peace out. Think you're in the kitchen with a job of work to do a Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?